In this video, we'll be looking at the human eye. We'll be looking at some of the structure and functions of the human eye using a diagram. And then also look at binocular vision and its importance. And then also at some of the changes that occur in the eye that enable us to see. And then lastly, some of the visual def defects that can happen in the human eye. Now, firstly, the eye uses photoreceptors. Now, if you remember from gra grade 11, when we did photosynthesis, photo means light. And then in the previous video, we talked about receptors, which are cells that are able to detect stimuli. So in this case, a photoreceptor is able to detect light stimuli coming into the eye. Moving on to the structure and functions of parts of the eye. So looking at this diagram at first, it might seem a little overwhelming, but it really, it really isn't. I know there's a lot of labels and a lot of functions, but as soon as you start peeling back the, the eye layer for layer, you'll see it's really not that bad. So I think what we'll do is we'll work our way from outside inwards and then make our way through the eye. The first one we'll look at is the conjunctiva, which is this one over there. And it sits, if I have to color it in, just so you know where it sits, um, it sits just in front of the cornea and it is a very thin mucous membrane that protects the eye. So it has pain receptors in it that will trigger the reflex of blinking. So let's say you are riding a bicycle and you're on a dirt road and a car drives by. What will happen is there's going to be dust particles thrown into the air and eventually they're going to reach your eye. As soon as they touch that membrane, it's going to trigger the pain receptors and they are in turn going to trigger um, the eyelids to, to blink. And that is in an effort to get rid of the debris or anything that is bothering the eye at that stage. So that is the function of the conjunctiva. Then the next one we'll look at is the cornea. And the cornea is this layer over here. So it sits on the front of the eye. And this is the only thing that can be uh, transplanted without having an exact blood donor match uh, because there's no blood vessels that are in here. So you can actually have a cornea transplant without being an exact match with the blood type. So getting back to the facts, it allows light to pass into the inner parts of the eye. So firstly, if something allows light to come in, that means that it is transparent to a certain degree if it's going to allow light in. It also causes refraction or bending of the light. So as the light comes in, it will generally bend it towards a certain area on the retina, which in fact is that area over there, which we'll look at very shortly. So that is the function of the cornea. Next, we'll look at the pupil. So the pupil, if you've ever looked um, at somebody, I'm sure most of you have played with a torch and then you flash the light on your eye and then you take it away and you'll see that the, the little black part opens up and closes. Well, that is the pupil that, that you are looking at. So from the side view, it doesn't look much like anything you would see when you look at somebody from the front. But from the front, it is a, a circular black hole. Now, it allows light to come through it, and this opens and closes to allow a certain amount of light through. That depends on if it's, if it's really bright outside, you won't want to flood the eye with light, so then the pupil will be a very small hole. But if it's very dark outside and you want to get a lot of light into the eye to try and see better, then the pupil will be a very large hole. And we'll actually look at that when we get to two of the processes that we have to discuss with regards to the eye. And this one uh, pertains to the pupillary mechanism. So that is the function of the pupil. We'll look at it in more detail now. But another thing that plays a role with the pupil is the iris. And if you've also looked at somebody and you've seen that they've got brown eyes or they've got blue eyes or green eyes, that is the iris that you are looking at. So the iris is these two sections over here and that is it gives the eye its color and it also contains radial and circular muscles which we'll look at in a bit 
that also assists with the size of the pupil, so the pupillary mechanism. So the iris is also a very important part. The next one we'll look at is the aqueous humor. Now the aqueous humor is this um, area in front of the, the pupil and the iris and then also behind it in between the iris and the lens. So what does the aqueous humor do? It's a jelly-like substance, so it allows the, uh, the front of the eye to keep its shape. So it's just to keep the round shape of the eye and the same with the vitreous humor which we'll get into in a little bit. So let's move on to um, the next portion and this is another process that we'll look at. It forms part of the process of accommodation. Now this portion here, it should actually, this label should be pointing over there, the ciliary muscles, since this one is actually pointing to the suspensory, suspensory ligaments. Now these suspensory ligaments do work with the ciliary muscles. So the ciliary muscles sit right, let me get a different color, right over there that blue, this blue area, top and bottom. Okay, so the ciliary muscles are also known as the ciliary body. And then attached to them are the suspensory ligaments, which is this area over here. Now, what do the suspensory ligaments do? Well, they attach to the lens. So this area here is the lens. Okay and then it holds it in position. It allows the lens to change shape with the contracting and relaxing of the ciliary body. We'll look at that in a bit. Now it also, the ciliary body, what is its function? It allows the lens to change shape during accommodation. It contracts and relaxes. So we'll get into that a bit later. Let's now look at the lens. So the lens is this area over here. So what does the lens do? It focuses the image on the retina. So as light comes through the cornea and is refracted to a certain extent, the lens will refract it even further. Um, so what it does is it will focus the image onto the retina at the back. And that is the function of the lens. It also changes its shape for near and far images, which we'll look at in a bit. Next portion that we'll look at is the sclera, this one over here. And the sclera is if you look at somebody's eyes, once again from the front, and you see uh, the pupil and you see the, the iris. The white portion that you're seeing is the sclera, so this thing that goes around the eye completely is, is the sclera. And what does it do? It's a tough white outer coat. It protects the internal parts of the eye and then it also helps maintain the shape of the eye, the nice round shape. Then the next portion is the choroid and it's this blue layer just below the sclera. It is a dark, it's dark in color because it is rich in blood vessels to supply the cells of the eye with oxygen and nutrients and then the dark pigments also help absorb the excess light to prevent internal ref uh, reflection so the light bouncing all over the place so that pigment assists with that because we all know that white reflects and then darker materials will absorb. The next portion is the fovea which is that little area over there and the fovea actually has an easier name um, also known as the yellow spot. So in this area there is the largest concentration of rod and cone cells and this because of this it forms the clearest image out of the whole eye. Now rod and cone cells are photoreceptors. Rod cells, um, the more rod cells you have the more you'll see in black and white and the more cone cells you have the more color vision you have. So I remember it, the C for cone is also C for color. So humans, for example, have got quite a few cone cells, more than, more than the amount of rod cells that we have. Whereas with a, a cat like a lion that's a nocturnal predator, something that hunts at night, 
it will have more rod cells than cone cells to have night vision. It assists with night vision. So that also helps with forming a clear image. So when we have light reflecting, we want it to focus on that spot of the retina in the end. Blind spot, there's no rod or cone cells. That's the only spot on the eye where there's no, uh, one of the few spots on the eye where there's no image formed. The next one is the optic nerve. So basically what happens is after an image um, or light has been detected on the retina, that gets translated into an impulse and that gets sent uh, through the optic nerve to the cerebral cortex of the brain where the image gets interpreted and gives rise to sight. Then the retina is this dark red inner layer um, just below the chorea that you can see and it also contains rod and cone cells and then that helps to detect light stimuli, stimuli sorry, and convert it to nerve impulses that get sent through the optic nerve. Then the last one that we'll look at is the vitreous humor and the vitreous humor is all of this internal yellow part that you can see. It has a similar function to the aqueous humor, so it keeps the shape of the eyeball, it holds the retina in position, and then it reflects, uh, refracts light rays. We will now move on to binocular vision and see its importance. So binocular vision is also known as stereoscopic vision. Now what is that? That is when there are two forward-facing eyes that have overlapping fields of view. And those fields of view then combine an image as a whole to form one detailed image. So if you didn't understand a word of that, look at this diagram on the right hand side. So obviously you've got a, a right eye and a left eye. That right eye will have a field of vision and then the left eye will have a field of vision. But then there's somewhere in the middle where those two combine an image from both eyes. The image is put together and it gives you one detailed image. So if you look at this diagram, let me just zoom in a bit so we can see it a bit better. Oops. Looking at the right eye, you can see that there's a block and the right eye will see the block in a bit of a different perspective than the left eye if you look at the detail that is seen with the left eye. Then in the middle where these two images meet, you get one very detailed image that is a, it's a composition of both the right eye and the left eye of what they see and then you get that very detailed image. Now what is the importance of having binocular vision? So firstly, it allows us to judge distance, depth of field and the size of an object. So binocular vision actually enables you to be able to catch a ball or to judge a distance. And this is also where it comes in handy for predators and that's why all predators have fo two forward facing eyes so that they can have that binocular vision so that they can be able to judge distance, depth and the size of an object. Whereas if you look at herbivores, so this is a diagram representing um, the vision of a horse. So they have binocular vision, yes, but they also have monocular vision. So mono meaning one and bi you know means two. So they'll have vision from the right hand side so the right eye and then they'll have vision from the left eye and then there'll be a small area where that is combined but it's not as wide as our vision is. And then the, something that is quite unique is that they have a blind spot where they can't see anything going on in that little section. So the right eye, left eye also combine the images to form binocular vision but then they also have monocular vision because the eyes sit on the side. Let's carry on to accommodation. Not the accommodation where you sleep, but the accommodation of your eyes. 
So what is accommodation? It is the adjustment of the shape of the lens to see objects. This is to compensate for objects that are near and then objects that are far. Now this has to do with this little thing sitting right there, which is the lens. Now when we talk about near and far vision, so distant vision and near vision, what classifies as far? So objects further than six, uh, than six meters classify as distant vision, and then objects that are closer than that six meters will classify as near vision. And because of those distance, those changes in distance, your eye will have to accommodate to that distance change in order for you to see an image clearly. Now the parts of the eye that are involved here is the ciliary muscles uh, or the uh, ciliary body and then the suspensory ligaments and then also the lens itself. So the ciliary body is this area here that I'm coloring in as blue. Okay, so that is the ciliary body. Now what happens if something is further than 6 meters? The ciliary muscles are relaxed. So if, if we were to say that ciliary body is a chunk like this, and if it's relaxed, it will be nice and flat and relaxed. But if it is contracted, let's say it will look something like that. Okay. So just so you know the difference between them. Okay, so if something is further than 6 meters, the ciliary muscles are relaxed, so it's in a nice relaxed state. Then the suspensory ligaments are tight or taut because of that. So remember now the suspensory ligaments are this little, it's that little area I'm coloring in in blue as well now. And they attach to the lens. So because the ciliary muscle or the body is relaxed, it's going to pull on those sus suspensory ligaments and pull them nice and tight. Whereas if it is contracted, like when an uh, object is close, so then the ciliary body is, is basically flexed, then what will happen is those suspensory, suspensory ligaments will become slack. So now they are nice and tight and because they are tight they are also going to pull at the lens at which they are attached and this will make the lens become flatter and less convex. So convex means like almost a circle. So when they become less convex they're more of an oval, a, a stronger oval shape. So this means that light rays are bent or refracted less and thus the light rays are able to focus on the retina. Remember this all happens so that we can see a clear image. So let's look at this diagram. As light comes in, they go through the cornea, they get refracted a bit and then because the image is far away, what's going to happen? The ciliary body relaxes which pulls on those suspensory ligaments which in turn pull on the lens and make it less convex, so it pulls it in flatter. That means because that lens is now coming in flatter, that light is refracted less and it then focuses on the retina at the back. Now let's look at if something is close, closer than 6 meters. So what I said was that the ciliary muscle becomes contracted so it, it, it pulls against itself then what will happen is those suspensory ligaments will become slack because now that's a, that ciliary body has kind of moved up. Now because that happens those suspensory ligaments won't uh, pull on the lens anymore so that means there's less tension on the lens so the lens bulges out so it becomes more convex and then light rays are refracted or bent more and thus they are focused on the retina. So with an image that is closer, light comes in, 
into the cornea and then what happens is because it's so much closer the ciliary bodies contract which means the suspensory ligaments slacken it means that there's less tension on that lens so it'll become a bit more uh, convex so it bulges which means that the light is refracted way more so it comes in much tighter and it focuses in on the retina at the back. I'm going to show you another picture but please don't confuse it with the pupillary mechanism when we are done with this video. Uh, I would like you to actually replay the video from this section so that you can just see the difference between accommodation and the pupillary mechanism with these diagrams. So this is not the pupil. That is actually the lens we are looking at. And then this um, cluster of cells, or muscles rather, sorry, is the ciliary muscles or the ciliary body. Then these longer ones are the suspensory ligaments that we are looking at. So if something is far away, so if we're looking at something further than six meters, what's going to happen is those ciliary muscles are going to relax. Can you see they pulling in on themselves a bit and then the suspensory ligaments are going to be pulled tight. Now because that happens and they're attached to the lens, they're going to pull the lens out and make it a bit uh, flatter, so less convex, so that the light can focus on the retina. But if something is closer than six meters, what's going to happen, those ciliary muscles are going to contract, so they're going to pull and they're going to become bigger. Because that happens, the suspensory ligaments become slack. Can you see there in the picture, they're not as tight as they were, which means that they're not pulling on the lens as much as they were, and that makes the lens bulge out and become more convex so that the light is refracted more and can be focused on the retina. Now we're going to look at the pupillary mechanism. So the pupillary mechanism controls the amount of light entering the eye by adjusting the size of the pupil. So obviously, I'm sure you've seen, or when you were little, you played with flashlights and then you looked at how your eye was changing depending on whether you put the flashlight on your eye or taking it away. And that is all to do with low light or dim light conditions and then bright light. And your eye basically works like, it's almost like a camera. So on a camera you'll have to set the aperture and all of these things that will allow a certain amount of light in. So if it's very bright outside, you're going to ha want the hole very tiny. So like this one with bright light, you'll see that the pupil is much smaller than the one with dim light. Because it's bright outside, we don't need a lot of eye rushing uh, light rushing into the eye to blind it. Whereas with it, if it's very dark outside, we want light to come in so that we can see better. So let's look at what the structures are that are involved here. So firstly, it is the radial muscles of the iris, as well as the circular muscles, and then the pupil itself that we are looking at. So firstly, let's look at dim light. So when there's not a lot of light outside, we want to open up the pupil as much as possible so that light can stream in and that we can see an image clearer. So the first thing is radial muscles of the iris contract. So what on earth are radial muscles? Now the radial muscles are these muscles that you see stretching over here. So I've told my previous students that think of it as a set of blinds. So if you are pulling at blinds to open them, then you're going to pull everything up at once. And that is through the radial muscles. So the radial muscles want to open um, the, the window, which is the pupil in this case, much more. So if you pull on the radial muscles, it's going to pull all these blinds, which are these circular muscles, the ones going in circles. It's going to pull them up. So radial muscles of the iris contract and the circular muscles of the iris relax. Now the circular muscles are these ones that go around. Now in order for the radial muscles to contract, 
they have to be relaxed so that the the radial muscles can pull open the pupil so it can become wider so that more light can enter the eye looking at bright light conditions so when we don't want a lot of light coming into the eye the radial muscles of the iris relax so these muscles are going to relax now we're going to close the blinds again so basically they relax and because they relax the circular muscles can now contract so these ones pull close um, they pull together and they close up the pupil and thus the pupil becomes smaller and less light will enter the eye can you see how this uh, these two diagrams look very similar to this one of the suspensory ligament and the ciliary muscles or the ciliary body. So that's why I said just go back and have a look at the difference between the two. And then lastly, we are going to look at visual defects. So there are four visual defects that you need to know about. So it's short-sightedness, far-sightedness, and then astigmatism and cataracts so let's look at short-sightedness also known as myopia so this is when you can see objects that are close very clearly but not objects that are far and the reason for that is that the lens cannot flatten enough the eyeball shape so the eyeball in this case is longer than usual the shape of the eyeball and then light is bent too much by the lens so light falls in front of the retina. But don't worry, this can be corrected by wearing glasses or contact lenses that are concave in shape and even laser surgery. So looking at, we just, at what we just saw. Now, the eyeball will be longer in shape. So it's, you won't be able to see it on this one because we don't have a normal eyeball for reference. But the eyeball shape is a bit longer than usual so in this diagram a normal eyeball shape would be somewhere there because that is the focus point of of the light so when we say that the lens cannot flatten enough it means that this lens over here cannot flatten enough because the eyeball is a bit longer in shape so now the light is bent and it falls in front of the retina so there's the retina that's where we want the light but now it's being focused there because the eyeball is a bit longer in shape as well so what do we do we get glasses or contact lenses that are concave in shape that will refract that light out a bit more so that it can be focused precisely right and then get onto the retina Looking at hyperopia, so this is when you can see objects that are far very clearly, but not close objects. So the lens cannot become convex enough, and the eyeball is shorter in shape than usual. So the light does not bend uh, the light rays in, sorry, the lens does not bend the light rays enough, so light falls behind the retina. But once again, this can also be corrected by wearing glasses or contact lenses that are convex, not concave, but convex in shape. So looking at this, the eyeball is much shorter. So technically the eyeball should end there because that is where we want the image to be projected on the retina. But at the moment it's projecting behind the retina, once again because the lens cannot become convex enough and then the eyeball is also shorter in shape. So you can see that the light is... Um, refracted by the cornea early as well so how we can correct that is having a convex lens or contact lens or glass glasses that will bend the light a bit differently so that the image can be focused on the retina and then lastly we'll look at the last two astigmatism and cataract so astigmatism is when the curvature of the lens or the cornea is irregular and this so a normal cornea is round where an irregular cornea is oval so that will give rise to it and then the light rays focused 
on more than one focal point. So the light rays literally bounce all over the place because the cornea has an irregular oval shape. So what's going to happen is the light bounces everywhere instead of being focused on one specific point. How can that be fixed? Once again, glasses or contact lenses and laser surgery. Then cataracts, I'm sure some of you would have heard about cataracts before. So this is when the lens of the eye becomes cloudy and you can see it very nicely in this picture. Um, so the lens becomes cloudy and how does that happen? Because of the proteins in the lens that start to clump together. This usually occurs with age and then this will grow over time and then the lens will become even more white. How can you fix this with eye surgery so they will generally remove the old lens and replace it with a clear synthetic one. And that brings us to the end of the human eye.